Next, we're going to take a look at the derivatives of the secant and cosecant function. In other words, the reciprocal trigonometric functions. So you'll recall that secant of x is defined by the relation secant x is equal to 1 divided by cosine of x, whereas sine of x is defined as 1 over, not sine, cosecant of x. is defined as 1 over sine of x. So secant and cosine, secant and cosecant are the reciprocals of cosine and sine respectively. And the reason we don't use the superscript minus 1 is because that's re reserved for the inverse function. Recall that cosine inverse of x is not the same as secant of x. So this is not equal to 1 over cosine of x. So for any other uh, superscript here other than minus 1, it does represent cosine of x to that power. So for example, cosine squared of x represents cosine of x to the minus 1, or to the squared, and so forth. So cosine cubed x is cosine of x quantity cubed. However, for the negative powers, instead of using cosine, we use secant, and instead of using sine, we use cosecant. So secant of x already represents cosine of x to the minus 1. The reason we don't use the negative superscripts is because this is the arc cosine. So in other words, the inverse cosine function. So it's defined such that cosine, arc cosine of x, or arc cosine of cosine of x, is equal to x. So arc cosine cosine of x is equal to x. And this is for x on the appropriate range. So cosine function looks like this. Here's pi. And the main portion where cosine is invertible is 0 to pi. So this is for x on 0 to pi. So as long as x is between 0 and pi, and this is the the restricted domain on which cosine of x is invertible, then the arc cosine of the cosine of x is equal to x. So for example, if you have um, y equals cosine of x, x would equal arc cosine of y. So this inverse cosine or arc co cosine is in the sense of the inverse function to the cosine function. And similarly, sine minus 1 of x represents the arc sine of x. So this is just a, a brief reminder that the minus 1 is always reserved for the inverse function to the trigonometric function. So we have a special name for the reciprocal. So the reciprocal of cosine is secant, and the reciprocal of sine is cosecant. And of course, the reciprocal of tangent is called cotangent. So in this lecture, we're going to look at the derivative rules for the secant function and the cosecant function. And we'll save the derivative rule for cotangent and tangent for uh, a later section when we talk about um, derivatives of, or when we talk about the product rule. So we'll save those ones for later. So let's start with secant of x. So let's say we have f of x is equal to secant of x and we want to compute a formula for the derivative. Now, as it turns out, we already have all of the power and technology we need in order to uncover this derivative rule. So first of all, recall that secant of x is 1 divided by cosine. So this is, in fact, 1 over cosine of x, which is the same as cosine of x to the minus 1. So at first, you want to think, I'm going to use some sort of trig function or trig derivative rule when I take the derivative of secant of x. But that's not exactly true. The first thing we're going to do is, or the first thing we're going to use is the power down rule. Because what secant of x is, is it's cosine of x reciprocal. So it's cosine of x raised to the power of minus 1. Right? So cosine of x is the inside function. So we take the derivative of cosine second. So first, we just view this as something to the minus 1. So here, it's just like 
blob to the minus one, and whenever we have something to the minus one, the derivative f prime of x, we bring the, mi the power down so it's minus, same thing inside stays the same, cosine of x, we subtract one from the exponent, so to the minus two, and then we multiply by the derivative of the inside. Now we just saw that the derivative of cosine is negative sine. So we're going to multiply this by negative sine. Now here's my uh, little caveat. Instead of multiplying by negative sine, so instead of putting minus sine of x here, keep track of the minus sign in your head and move it up front and just change that to a plus. Otherwise it can easily be, be confused for cosine of x to the negative 2 power times or minus sine of x. So it gets a little bit muddied when you write that down that way. So always try to promote your negative signs to the front of the term. Um, and also the reason we can write cosine of x to the minus 1, whereas I just said you can't write cosine negative 1 of x, this is something else, that's the arc cosine, is because here cosine of x is in its own parentheses. And we're saying this quantity raised to the power negative 1. So this is okay for the secant function, whereas cosine negative, negative one directly, that shorthand is reserved for the arc cosine. Okay, so hopefully you'll you see the difference there. So when we use the shorthand where we put the exponent right by the cosine, the negative one means the inverse function, not the reciprocal. Here we're just saying cosine of x to the minus one, so cosine of x, we're taking the reciprocal of that. So that's basically the derivative, right? So it's something to the minus one, the minus one comes down, something to the minus two, then we multiply by the derivative of the inside. Now since we know now the derivative of the inside, which is the derivative of the cosine function, we can write that as minus sine. So the minus cancels out the other minus, and we just get cosine of x to the negative two times sine of x. Now this is the same as sine of x over cosine squared of x. And this is the same as 1 over cosine of x times sine of x over cosine of x. Now the reason we do these extra steps is because there's a nice way to remember the derivative of secant, or there's a standard conventional way to think of it. And that is as, fo as follows. So 1 over cosine is secant of x, sine over cosine is tangent of x. So the derivative rule is d by dx of secant of x is equal to secant x tangent x. So the derivative of secant x is equal to secant x tan x. Derivative of secant is secant tan. So you can remember that if you'd like. Uh, I never really did. Uh, I always just remembered the steps so whenever I had to face derivative of secant x, I said, okay, that's cosine of x to the minus 1. Minus 1 comes down, so minus cosine to the minus 2 times the derivative of the inside. Okay, it's sine of x times cosine squared, or sine of x over cosine squared x, and then I worked it out like that. Though, you know, it is a useful formula. If you don't want to go through all those steps every time you see the secant function, you know, you can remember that the derivative of secant of x is secant of x times tangent of x. But it's important to remember the steps, or at least the logic behind the steps, because if you ever forget the formula, you can always rederive it. So that's why knowing some of these basic derivations is useful. So the derivative of secant x is secant x tan x. Now, with our other examples, we saw a, a generalized form where instead of sine of x, we looked at sine of u of x. So you had some other inside function other than x. So for example, instead of sine of x, if we have sine of 3x, the derivative would be cosine of 3x times the derivative of the inside, which is 3. So remember, sine of u of x, the derivative was cosine of u of x times u prime of x. Uh, cosine of u of x, the derivative was negative sine of u of x times u prime of x. e to the u of x, the derivative was e to the u of x times u prime of x. So you, you, you see a pattern. We're going to uh, talk about why this, these things are true 
uh, in our next lecture on uh, the, the uh, chain rule. Uh, but you, you, you can obviously see the pattern, and the pattern extends to the secant function. So we know that the derivative of secant is secant tan. So what do you think the derivative, so if I said d by dx of secant of u of x, what do you think the derivative of the secant of u of x would be? So hopefully you've guessed correctly. So it's secant of u of x, tangent of u of x. So we just take the derivative of secant like normal, like it was an x in there instead of a u of x. And then, so secant of u, the derivative of sec is equal to secant of u, tangent of u. And then we correct for the fact that we're not taking the derivative with respect to u, right? This is not d by du, it's d by dx. So we have to correct for that fact by then multiplying by du dx. So this is basically the derivative with respect to u times du dx. So the derivative of secant of u of x is equal to secant of u of x tangent u of x times u prime of x. So that's how you take the derivative of a composite function where the outer function is secant and the inner function is some u of x. So to do an example of that, just a brief example, let's consider secant of sine of x. Okay, well the derivative, so here sine of x is the inside function, so that's my u. So the derivative is going to be, we just take the derivative of the outer function, secant, so secant of whatever, in this case that whatever is the sine of x. So secant of whatever times tangent of whatever times the derivative of whatever, so times cosine of x. So that's the derivative of secant of sine of x. So pretty nifty you know, when you can do these com composite functions like that. So that's the derivative of secant of x and secant of u of x. So next, let's look at the derivative of cosecant. So just up top, we'll save this for comparison. Derivative of secant of x was equal to secant of x tangent of x. And of course, this works for any other variable. If you take the derivative of secant of theta, and of course it would be the derivative with respect to theta, not the derivative with respect to x, you would get secant theta tangent theta. So sometimes, you know, it's a matter of style, I suppose, or a particular application, but you might see d by d theta of secant theta is equal to secant theta tangent theta. Right? These are really the same rules because it doesn't really matter what we call the independent variable. We could call it x, we can call it w, we can call it theta, we can call it phi, we can call it smiley face. You know, whatever you call it, um, you know, the rule is exactly the same. But the important part and the reason we don't need to use that second generalized form is that what we're taking the derivative with respect to, this d by dx, matches the variable we're using on the inside. It's only when there's a mismatch that we have to correct by that extra factor, that u prime of x factor. So that's the um, rule for secant of x. Now let's take a look at f of x is equal to cosecant of x. Now cosecant of x is 1 over sine of x, and that, of course, is sine of x all raised to the minus 1. So we're going to use the same rule, the same trick. We're going to use the power down rule. So using the power down rule, we're going to take the minus one in the exponent, power it down. The new exponent, we subtract one, and then we multiply by the derivative of the inside. So f prime of x, exponent comes down out front, so we get minus, stuff inside stays unchanged, unaltered. Sine of x, now we subtract one from the exponent, so instead of minus one, it's to the minus two. So it's negative sine of x to the minus 2. So, so far, we took the derivative of u to the minus 1. It's minus u to the minus 2. But we're not taking the derivative of u. We're taking the derivative of x. So we have to correct that by multiplying by the derivative of the inside. The derivative of sine is cosine. So the power came down minus sine of x who subtracted 1, sine of x to the minus 2. But we weren't taking the derivative with respect to sine of x, we're taking the derivative with respect to x. 
So we have to multiply by an extra factor equal to the derivative of this inside function, the inside function being sine of x. So we're multiplying by the derivative of sine of x, which is cosine of x. Cleaning this up a little bit, this is minus cosine of x over sine squared x, which is equal to minus 1 over sine of x times cosine of x over sine of x. And that's, of course, equal to 1 over sine is cosecant, so it's minus cosecant of x cotangent of x. So basically, we've just showed that the derivative of cosecant of x is equal to negative cosecant of x cotangent of x. So derivative of secant is equal to secant tan. Derivative of cosecant is equal to negative cosecant cotan. So notice that secant goes to secant tan and cosecant goes to negative cosecant cotan. So for the cosecant, it's the same formula, except instead of secant, it's cosecant. Instead of tan, it's cotan. So here, there's an extra co in front of everything. Instead of secant, cosecant. Instead of secant, cosecant. Instead of tan, cotan. And then there's also an extra minus sign on, in the derivative. So, you know, they're, they're very similar, so they're easy to remember together. So derivative of secant of x, secant tan. Derivative of cosecant x, negative cosecant cotan. Um, and of course, we can do our generalization. So the derivative with respect to x of cosecant of u of x is negative. I'll give you a moment to think what the derivative might be. Derivative of cosecant of u of x is negative cosecant of u of x, cotangent of u of x. Oh, I, knew you, I knew you had it. So instead of the x, it's the same formula, except we're just replacing x with u of x. And then we have to correct this by multiplying by u prime of x. And the correction comes because this is basically d by du of the function that we're taking the derivative of, and then times du dx. So to get d by dx, we take d by du and multiply it by du dx. You can kind of see in your head it's like the du's cancel out. So this is essentially the chain rule that we're using. And I've alluded to the chain rule several times. And we've been using the chain rule without really formalizing it in you know, a mathematical theorems. But we'll do that soon enough. But uh, I do this approach because oftentimes they don't do any examples with the chain rule. They just throw out the chain rule as some sort of theoretical formula, or more abstract formula, and then they do all of the applications of the chain rule at once, and it can get confusing. It's difficult to see the forest from the trees. So I like to you know, say, here's the generalized rule. We're not going to justify this one yet, but it will be justified later when we do the chain rule. So you're getting used to practicing the chain rule in a variety of contexts, so that when we see the chain rule, the, the formalism of it will make more sense, because you've already had a lot of experience doing these sorts of ones. So as an example, let's take the derivative of cosecant of square root of x. Why not? OK, it's negative cosecant square root of x cotangent square root of x times the derivative of the square root of x, which is 1 over 2 square root of x. And you'll recall that square root of x is equal to x to the 1 half. So when we take the derivative, the 1 half comes down, so we get 1 half x, then we subtract 1 from the exponent, 1 half minus 1 is negative 1 half. And x to the minus 1 is 1 over x, so that minus sign in the exponent is the reciprocates this, and the 1 half square roots it, so this is 1 over 2 square root of x. But notice that this work that I did here, where I converted x to x to the 1 half, and I brought down the 1 half x to the minus 1 half, then I interpreted x to the minus 1 half as the minus sign does the reciprocal and the 1 half does the square root, so it's 1 over 2 square root of x 
when I wrote down this answer, I didn't really spend a lot of time thinking all that all happened mentally in my head. I just said, okay, x to the one half, one half comes down, x to the minus one half. And also, it, you know, you see this one, the square root of x, and you kind of remember it. Like, oh, square root of x, it's one over two square root of x. But this is, you know, good for mental math, you know, to do that sort of stuff in your head. Feel free to write it on, on paper as many times as you want. But as you practice and grow and get experience taking these derivatives, you'll remember, oh, square root of x is just 1 over 2 square root of x. And if you forget, you can do it in your head. Square root of x, x to the 1 half, 1 half comes down. So it's 1 half x to the minus 1 half, x to the minus 1 half, the minus sign kicks it to the denominator, the 1 half does the square root. So it's 1 over 2 square root of x. So hopefully you should you know, be comfortable enough with this sort of calculation to do those sorts of steps in your head. Don't feel bad if, you, if you're still writing those steps on paper. Write it on paper as many times and as long as you need, but there will, be, there will come a day where you'll say, oh yeah, I don't need to write this on paper anymore. I, I remember how it goes. I can see what's going on in my head. I can visualize it and just go from square root of x to 1 over 2 square root of x. And that helps save on paper and you know makes your notes a little bit cleaner. All right, so that is the introduction to the secant and cosecant functions.